delighted to welcome you here to tonight's conversation with James Palos about his new book, Human Forever, The Digital Politics of Spiritual War. As I was preparing for the uh, introduction here this evening, I was reading a review of uh, Dr. Palos's book, and I stumbled upon this, uh, I think, rather interesting uh, review in the uh, blog site, uh, The Worthy House Blog by J uh, Charles Haywood. Uh, Haywood writes, and I quote, I won't lie to you, this is a challenging book, deep, complex, and at points, Baroque. That's not broke. <laughs> Baroque. That's part of its charm. I'm not even sure what genre this book belongs to. It is largely political philosophy, but also autobiography, spiritual memoir, and history. But it rewards close reading and close attention. Hollis brings it all together successfully. You may not immediately see the link between Paul Klee's artwork, Angelus Notice, and our current times, or all the connections among the multitude of other topics discussed, but you will once Paulus explains it to you. And so I am delighted to have James with us here to explain it to us. James Paulus is the executive director of the American Mind at the Claremont Institute. He uh, graduated from Duke with honors uh, in political science undergrad and received his PhD from Georgetown. He is the author of The Art of Being Free in 2017, which is a study on Tocqueville's democracy in America. He is also a contributing editor of American Affairs and a fellow at the Center for the Study of Digital Life. And for those of you not familiar with that organization, I highly recommend your exploring it. A frequent commentator on technology and the American character, his writing has been featured in publications from National Affairs to National Review and Foreign Affairs to Foreign Policy and praised at the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the New Yorker. Dr. Paulus has appeared on numerous television and radio programs and delivered remarks before audiences at organizations and campuses across the country. We are delighted to have him here at Pepperdine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Paulus. Well, I can only start by asking for your forgiveness. <laughs> I know that, uh, that it's on me that I went to the wrong library. And so it's, uh, it's nice to be here with you. And um, just got back from Austin, Texas. It's a hot and happy scene out in Austin. Um, among other things, I was, uh, I was hosting the launch party for a new publication called Return. Which is sort of the tech publication that you know deep down inside you need and can't seem to find anywhere for some strange reason. There's this <laughs> boy with there's got sort of bitter tech journals on the East Coast and trying to destroy anyone who has a new idea. And you have sort of technologists in Silicon Valley who are really lost in their own heads, and it's like, what about the rest of us? Uh, and so the endeavor with Return, uh, the website Return.life is, is live now on the internet, so I would encourage you to drop by. Uh, it's more than a publication, it's a membership community. You can subscribe and get our print quarterly, which will be dropping very soon. Uh, you can unlock access to events, all kinds of great stuff. I, yes, I am giving you a pitch, I'm a salesman now. And, uh, and the reason why I'm starting with this is not just to, uh, to vlog the website in addition to the book, uh, but because um, what I want you to have in the back of your mind um, as, I, as I talk here is that uh, we are Americans, we're stuck being Americans, and America is a commercial republic. Very important to how we, uh, how we find our way out of this mess. Um, so let's talk about the mess. Uh, one of the guys who was at uh, the launch party last night is a guy named John Stokes, who some of you, uh, am I dating myself? I don't know. Some of you may know as the founder of the website Ars Technica website has been around for, I guess, at this point, a long time. Uh, John is now in an hour outside of Austin uh, in the hinterlands uh, with the ranch and the horses and the daughters riding the horses. And uh, he's, uh, he's going around saying, keep Georgetown, Georgetown, Texas, normal, which I guess is the spiritual counterweight to keep Austin weird. Uh, anyway, um, 
I gave a speech uh, there, I gave another speech at the Austin Institute, um, I gave a third speech in Dallas uh, a couple days ago, so rather than just reading off more sheets of paper, uh, I thought tonight I would speak from the heart and from the phone. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is how we do it. Um, Stokes had a tweet this morning, um, and uh, he did not tell me that he was going to do this. Um, he said that he went to uh, the lunch party the other night and was trying to describe the crowd to his wife afterwards. Um, and he said, I'm telling her that the people basically self-identified as right, so she's like, but in what way? And his response is, they're sort of just Clinton-era liberals. Hmm. <laughs> Has it come to this? She asked for some examples of right-wing positions, and he said to her, uh, no morals-based censorship of media and entertainment, uh, women's sex-based rights, colorblind college admissions, melting pot model, model of multiculturalism, no religious indoctrination in public schools. He said, I ended up making up the term MTV liberals for her. <laughs> They're basically what MTV-watching liberals used to be like in the 90s, but they just never moved left with the rest of the left. So now I'm right. So, uh, you know, your mileage may vary, um, and I'm going to let you sort of ponder the meaning of these phrases, uh, and by the end of this little talk, I think you might have maybe a different perspective on them than John does, but I must admit, and I have been pub on public record uh, for a long time, uh, that sort of the, the, the wedge that kind of opened my mind onto um, everything I've sort of been writing and thinking about and talking about uh, since 1998, now I am dating myself, um, was really watching uh, Marilyn Manson's video for his uh, single The Dope Show off of his record Mechanical Animals in September of 1998, um, where uh, the viewer is presented with this kind of uncanny and alien spectacle of this uh, androgenized figure sort of wandering through hills and being captured by scientists, strapped down to a table and uh, experiences a number of medical interventions of some uh, creepily uh, ambiguous kind, um, and emerges uh, as a rock star, um, a rock star who uh, causes uh, a riot uh, during the live performance, um, and the riot police run in, uh, and they're all dressed head to toe in pink, um, and they're shown briefly in amorous embraces. Uh, and, uh, and Manson, uh, who at that time I think was just, just pushing 30 years old. Um, the line in the song that caught my attention was, Cops and queers make good looking models. And I thought, these two things are merging into one big thing that's going to be like a cop and like uh, the sort of queer culture. It's going to turn to one thing. Um, and I discussed that for a number of years under the heading of the Pink Police State. Uh, if you have read uh, Rob Dreher's latest book, uh, he talks about this a little bit toward the end. Um, and so, it's true, guilty as charged. Um, I learned from MTV, and, and here we are today. Um, and I think it's revealing that, you know, you can't really, you can't really find good videos on MTV anymore. Sometimes you can't even find videos. I mean, this has been true for, for years now. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's some, some good stuff on there, I guess. Uh, but honestly, I wouldn't know. I haven't really turned on a TV in a number of years, uh, and, uh, and I don't think I'm, I'm the worst for wear for that. Uh, but the 1990s was culturally a very powerful time. Um, it wasn't just MTV, it wasn't just television. Uh, it was a string of films, original films from original scripts or adaptations of original uh, contemporary novels uh, that were very powerful and very distinct and are now considered to be classics in their own right. Um, you know, I, uh, I will name some of them, and you will probably recognize them, even if they came out before you were born. Um, Twelve Monkeys, 1996, uh, the story of uh, a shadowy cabal of elites that decides that uh, human civilization has uh, gone a little too far and decides to wipe it out using a pathogen that they spread around the world. <laughs> Uh, Fight Club, uh, 1999. Uh, you might remember the scene where uh, Ed Norton is in the bathtub nursing his wounds and he says to, uh, to Brad Pitt, I won't give away any spoilers in case you haven't seen the film. Uh, he said, uh, you know, he was talking to his dad when he graduated high school, and he said, Dad, now what do I do? And his dad said, go to college. And then he 
went to college. And I said, Dad, now what do I do? And he said, get married. He said, I can't get married. I'm a 32-year-old boy. Well, um, I've been trying to tell people that maybe this was an important film that we could learn some things from. For a number of years, I wrote about it in, uh, in, a, in a book, an edited volume, uh, edited by Joan Goldberg, of all people, called uh, Proud to be Right, Young Conservatives Under 30 Talking About Their Experiences. Uh, and even at that time, this is 10 years after Fight Club, um, you know, I, uh, I lived in that building where his apartment blows up. Um, I lived one floor up, two units over in downtown LA. Um, in the book, it's, uh, or let's see, the movie, it's called Pearson Towers. Uh, in real life, it's called Promenade Towers. You can go down and see yourselves at first in Los Angeles. Uh, in the movie, he says it was a filing cabinet for widows and young professionals. True. The walls are made of concrete. True. I lived it. Um, but what I realize now, what I see now, um, is that the reason why people can't get married isn't because they are uh, in a state of emotional arrest and experiencing a failure to launch, although to be sure that, that is going on. It's because they can't afford to. It's because they can't find any prospects. It's because the culture, the socioeconomic foundations of marriage are being destroyed. They're being taken away from people. Uh, and even young people realize this. I've got a 12-year-old son, and he's experienced the past two years. He's seen it at ground level, you know. He's, Dad, tears are down his eyes. Down his cheeks, I should say. What happened to everyone? Where are all the cool people? Where are the normal people? Why are people dumber in seventh grade than they were in fifth grade? <laughs> and there are answers to that. But this is a process that's been unfolding, uh, you know, very slowly and then all at once. But of course, the biggest, uh, the biggest film of the 90s, in some respects, I think, and uh, certainly the biggest of 99, The Matrix. Um, I don't know if you've seen The Matrix recently. Uh, you probably know what has become of the, uh, the directors of The Matrix. Uh, but I will not dwell on them. I, instead, I will dwell on the, uh, the fake steak. Uh, Joey Pants sitting there with his, uh, his little soul patch. And uh, he was, uh, his name was Cypher. Uh, sitting across from uh, from whoever uh, eating his his juicy steak, and he says, "The Matrix tells me that I'm eating a nice juicy steak, and I know it's not real. I know it's not real meat, but I want it to be, and so I eat it. And uh, where are we today? Uh, we are in a world where Bill Gates is telling you, 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 you me, that every uh, industrialized country in the world should." Entirely to 100% fake meat. The Matrix will make our meat, they'll print it in the lab, they'll ship it out, we'll eat it. Well, no, it's not meat, but the Matrix will tell us that it is, and that's going to be good enough for us. So, even then, even in 99, uh, it was clear that the form of technology was exerting a sort of controlling, reshaping force over the content in the technological surround. And that content can be everything from food, to art, to people, uh, to identities, uh, and to uh, money. Um, and we're experiencing all those things. Uh, the memory of machines became powerful, more powerful than the human imagination. And it got to a point where you, know, you could count on a machine to lie to you. Uh, and the sudden triumph of that network of recollection and recall that the machines are doing all over the world was so impressive, so awesome, uh, so total, uh, that what once might have been a fantasy uh, just became sort of a lie, a knowing lie. Um, it's a big transformation from where America used to be. Uh, in the TV age, um, you know, this is the age of Willy Wonka seeing pure imagination. This is the age of John Lennon seeing Imagine. Uh, imagine there's no heaven, no religion too. Uh, this is the, the age of Walt Disney's Imagineers. You know, look what the Imagineers are doing now. They're imagining that a three-year-old can have these thoughts and then we should turn them into this sort of new kind of being. Um, and, uh, and more and more people seem to believe, yes, this is things have gotten to a point where we need to um, use technology to engage in these interventions to create new type of being, um, you know, believe it or not, uh, you can't just say that you are a member of a new 
sex and spontaneously and retroactively transubstantiate into that new sex. Everyone knows this is true. Uh, we just pretend otherwise. And why do we pretend otherwise? Uh, well, because what's really happening is you're transforming from a, a male or a female into a cyborg, into a half human, half machine entity, the likes of which we have never seen on planet Earth in 12,000 years plus. Uh, you know, you can go all the way back to the animals before us didn't do that. God didn't do it. But we're doing it now. Um, the collapse of the mystique of the imagination, which used to be so powerful. If you can dream it, you can do it. Americans really started to believe that we were the most ethical and the most expert of dreamers. And that whoever dreamed biggest and best deserves to rule the world. And on that basis, we did rule the world. Uh, yes, we won the Cold War because we had the biggest military research and development budget, um, but we also captured hearts and minds and souls with our big dreams, our biggest and best dreams. And in fact, America itself started to become something that people thought of as really, ultimately, just a dream. Just a really a dream that was better than other dreams. Yeah, there was a constitution, yeah, there was the people, yeah, there's the territory, the nation state, but that all seems very primitive and really America is an idea, as they said. What they really meant was it's a dream, it's a vision of what the future can be, a better future for everyone in the entire world, to turn the world into Americans, and then the world will be perfect. And this longing to perfect life on Earth, to perfect our human beings through the faculty of the imagination, this is what happens when television is the most powerful medium in the world. That is a medium that really foregrounds the, uh, the imagination and rewards whoever can represent through images and imagery what it is that they're imagining and use those representations to reach inside of people's hearts and minds, maybe even their souls, and, and do stuff, move them around, reshape them in their image. It was powerful, it was intoxicating, and it was so intoxicating that it led our military intelligence complex to say, we made these nuclear weapons, they're really powerful, but we can't really use them. So we're going to need new weapons. We're going to need weapons that we can use all the time, that can be on 24-7, um, that we can use on everyone all at once, all around the world. And, uh, and that's the internet. And we see the costs of, uh, of this form of weaponry. Um, in fact, as the, uh, these digital devices and entities that we all know and love, as they take over the world, to an extent that no person or group of people can rule the world anymore. The robots got it. It's theirs now. Uh, the collapse of that mystique of the imagination um, is making millions, maybe billions of people very mentally and physically ill. You go from being, we are the best and, and, and purest, most ethical, most expert of dreamers, our production of dreams, are, we're going to command technology through our ability to dream the best, and we're going to command the world through our ability to dream the best. And when you create something like the internet, and you've been marinating in that kind of megalomania of fantasy for that long, you think, well, this is just more technology that we're also inventing, and it's also, there are there are, our foot soldiers, our minions. These robots are going to execute on our planet, rule the world through the best dreams. Well, the digital entities don't really care about our dreams. They don't really care about our plans. They don't care about our souls. At best, they are indifferent to these things. And so the, uh, you know, the, the factions that ruled our world and ruled the West uh, woke up one morning, seemingly, and went, <gasps> the robots aren't obeying us. The robots elected Donald Trump president. What's happening? This is, oh my God, this is populism, nationalism, like Hungary, oh, Victor, what's going on? And they realized that they actually didn't control these things. And, uh, and you saw that there was a major crackdown, a crackdown that is, that is ongoing, uh, and that many people are, are scrambling and struggling to figure out how to stop, uh, much less to reverse. <clears throat> 
So, you know, I understand that. I mean, Barack Obama himself, you know, on the eve of the election, talking to, to Jeffrey Goldberg at the Atlantic, a man who I'm reliably told wakes up every morning hearing his mom's uh, voice in his ears asking him why he's not president of the United States yet. A little, little Atlantic inside gossip for you there. Uh, Obama tells Jeffrey Goldberg um, that, that what uh, the, the internet has done to um, America is, he said it was the single biggest threat to our democracy. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks, Obama. You know, he goes two years from being like selfie stick guy to being like the internet is going to destroy America. <laughs> so, well, what are you going to do about that? Well, you're going to control the internet, right? And everyone's trying to figure out how they can control these digital entities that are swarming throughout our bodies, our buildings, our lives. Um, until a few years ago, the only entities that could behave this way were angels and demons. And now we've invented invisible, innumerable, interoperable, instantaneously interoperable information entities. I think that's five eyes, as I like to call them. <laughs> the real five eyes. <laughs> Confronted with this, uh, people go, wow, my life has no meaning now. Why should I even bother? Compared to these machines, we're not like spiritual entities. We're just ugly bags of water. It's one of my dad's favorite Star Trek episodes. They sort of meet the aliens and they go, well, ugly bags of water. And yeah, that's how people feel. You know, like, fentanyl. Yes, please, sign me up. Uh, how many genders? I can get lost in this sort of labyrinth? Like, yes, finally. You know, I can take my eyes off. People want to be distracted. They want to take these weapons and change them into forms of entertainment. And that's what we've done. Uh, everything from cable television to the laser that reads your DVDs to touch screens, touch screen to GPS, um, encrypted communications, all this stuff is weaponry. And it's been turned, it's spun off into entertainment to distract people from the reality that the machines have taken over the world in a way that calls into question the most fundamental kind of manner what it is to be human. Why it even matters. So, the remarkable thing about these machines is that on the one hand, they they do sort of cause America specifically and human beings more generally to have this kind of nervous breakdown, a crisis of soul. Why should I bother being alive? Why should I bother having children? Why should I bother being physically fit? Uh, why should I bother working? You know why? But at the same time, um, the bots throw us back on a long overdue lesson, which is that reality is not fundamentally rational or mathematical, it's fundamentally theological. The only answers that you can find to the questions that the bots are forcing us to confront are theological answers. And that is why, when you look around the world, whether it's China or Russia or India or Israel, Vatican, every civilization state or representative of a civilization state that is powerful enough in the digital space to be a real player is rushing as fast as they can to catechize their bots, to program them to understand and replicate and enforce the deepest theological basket of meaning that is original to those. That creates real difference, the kind of difference that you can't just, you know, well, look at our very diverse board of directors. This is, you know, talking about the Clinton 90s, a cabinet that looks like America. That's what he said. I want a cabinet that looks like America. Uh, and he got that. But this is, you know, this is, no, this is, you, you can't just say, oh, Vladimir Putin is evil because he's so unlike us. Let's destroy his civilization. Let's purify Earth of the evil Russians. I mean, you know, I'm going to try to switch impressions now. One of my favorite Donald Trump lines um, was, uh, I'm just trying to stop the world from killing itself. <laughs> That's better than a cabinet that looks like America, let me tell you. <laughs> and when we are being thrust into a world where the only way that we can survive the trauma
triumph of these machines over our inner and outer lives is by accepting the theological nature of reality and falling back on those resources that are original to our civilizations. We are going to have to find a way to share this planet with people who have fundamental theological disagreements with us about what it is to be human. I don't make the rules. And please don't shoot the message. But it's not bad to come to this recognition. It's not bad to have these realizations, and they're long overdue. And this is why we find ourselves in a situation uh, that is the subtitle of this book, The Digital Politics of Spiritual War. We are engaged right now in the United States in a spiritual war because we have two fundamentally incommensurable, different theological propositions about what it means to be human. One side, you know, this just comes straight out of the founders. Uh, we are incarnate and sold beings uh, created by a God who, you know, your mileage may vary, but loves us, right? Um, and part of the goodness of that creation, it's good news to be human, is that our incarnate and sold beings have properties. They have these sort of intrinsic properties, and those properties uh, are there to be exercised by us um, in the manner of a steward of what was once called a husbandman, right? Someone like, you think of like animal husbandry. Um, and in order to exercise those properties, which are good and have been given to us for the purpose of good exercise, um, we need to inhabit a space-time where governments do not try to squeeze and crush and twist and reshape and transform and disfigure them. And the way in which we talk about preventing that from happening is through the language of rights. Now, the language of rights can itself be transformed and twisted and abused and disfigured. And that is why on the other side, we really do have a powerful group of people with millions of supporters who are saying, look, the only way that we're going to make it out of this, we can't beat the bots, we're going to join them. And we're going to join them by, uh, by turning children into transhumans, brave heroes. The vanguard. This is the way. Come with me if you want to live, as the cyborg Arnold Schwarzenegger said in Terminator. You know, except some of that muscular, masculine patriarchal is bad. So we're going to have a three year old girl do it. A three year old transhuman. Come with me if you want to live. This is a theological proposition about the nature of our being, and it goes back to you know, deeply Gnostic principles. Uh, it seems to be very hard to get Gnosticism out of Western religions. I've looked around, I mean, it, this is like, you know, this is really no hate, non-discrimination, Protestantism, Catholicism, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, Judaism, like, they all have strains of Gnosticism that are very hard to get rid of. And for those, you know, who are like, well, what, what's Gnosticism? Uh, it's very simple, you know. Uh, what is pure in you is the divine spark of consciousness or of spirit. Uh, and the rest of you, the, the ugly bag of water part, well, that is, uh, that is an impure construction of basically like a sub-god, like an evil demiurge. And the task, or the religious task, uh, is to shatter, is to break apart the natural confines that taint the pure spark within. And the goal, uh, the, the objective, spiritually, is to bring heaven onto earth, or to remove human beings from earth into heaven. Um, and so when you hear people talking about uploading their consciousness to the cloud and all that stuff, this has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And so we are entering into a period of protracted spiritual war. And how it is being expressed is through the politics of digital technology. That's what's going on. That's what I set out to address in the book. I'm just going to say one more thing, and then we can get to Q&A. Um, this is a special predicament for America. All these other countries, they don't have they don't have a, a First Amendment. They do not have encoded into their law a recognition of the people that it is the common sense of those people as a result of their theological understanding of their nature of being that you can't have a just regime that establishes a church. That the government cannot have a church and have that be the one church of the nation. That's a big wager. China didn't make that wager. Even England didn't make that wager. And you can see how cyborg theocracy is making such headway in these common law countries. British, Canadians, 
Australians, New Zealand. I mean, we've all seen the tapes over the past few years. These people are losing it. And it's easy to say, they're just crazy. It's not crazy. It's very conceptually sound. It is a serious, comprehensive wager of the nature of being in our relationship with the cosmos. But America, no official state, in the uh, state church, can't do it. Okay, well that's like a special predicament. Because in the West, the Western way of wars is religious war. You saw it in Europe, you see it here, civil war was a religious war. Um, and Americans in some strange way almost feel that they're most confident when they feel that they're fighting a religious war. Uh, and sure enough, it's a powerful motivator. Um, it's a powerful motivator and it excuses uh, a lot of bloodshed. Uh, but nowadays, what it, what it points to is exactly what Donald Trump said it would point to, which is the world killing itself. Um, and you know, I don't think I'm the only one to say we don't want that. But then how do we avoid even the civil war here in the US? We've already got a digital civil war going on. All you have to do is look at these things, you see it every day. A lot of people, it's the first thing they see when they wake up in the morning, it's the last thing they see when they go to bed. They probably dream about it too, if they can remember their dreams anymore. The digital civil war is going on. And uh, the predicament is how do we prevent it from consuming us? Uh, that, you know, this, this is a heavy question, and, and the reason um, my friend, uh, who created Canonic, the platform where I published the book uh, in Bitcoin, on the Bitcoin blockchain, you know, he's Albanian, and he likes to make fun of me for, for being Albanian, because my, my great-grandparents in Greek met on uh, really a battlefield in a field hospital in a, a northern Greek city called Yanina. And he goes, oh, James, you say, he likes to say he's Greek, but he's really Albanian. <laughs> Uh, but as an Albanian and an Orthodox guy, uh, he says, look, James, it's very simple. God is punishing America. 500 years of Protestant heresy, the Enlightenment, you know, it's all crashing down. Like, it's shut up, mine Bitcoin, go to church, go to the, go, go to buying land in East Texas. You know, he's, he's that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and theologically, I'm like, it's not, not implausible, right? Like, I'm certainly not going to try logically to rule out the idea that God is uh, that God is punishing America. In fact, um, you know, God has punished America before, like many times. I mean, like, life in America has not always been great. Not all about entertainment, not all about fun, not all about longevity. Um, tragedy after tragedy, suffering, long. And yet, the America that we you know, sort of walked into is one where a lot of people seem hell bent on forgetting that any of this ever happened. Uh, oh, well, in any suffering that did happen, that's injustice. And we can purify the divine spirit of America so that there's no more injustice and no more memories of those bad things. Because if you wipe out the memories, they'll never come back. That's the way that they think. So, yeah, in some respect, okay, divine punishment, sure. Uh, but there's another way in which, you know, America has a special cross to bear, one that other countries, I think, don't have to bear quite so much. We need to circulate socially and economically with one another all the time, every day, day in and day out, the unceasing labor of building and rebuilding the institutions that make the world run over and over again. If we do not do this, it's a straight out of democracy in America, we do this, we go inward, bitterness, brooding, melancholy, egotism, alienation, isolation, and then we go whoop over here. Uh, frenzy, envy, competition, pride, uh, frantic behavior, uh, losing yourself in money, greed, uh, exhaustion, and this is what we do. We swing back and forth and back and forth. This is also out of Augustine, if, uh, if you're keeping score at home. No rest but in thee, O oh Lord. Why? Because our anthropological framework is one more psychologically. We, we cannot find a way to just find our center without God. So Tocqueville says, look, this is why religion is so important in the democratic age, because it strengthens people right where they're weak. And he singles out Christianity. And he says, Christianity is good. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Two very simple rules, general rules, that you don't smother everyday life with all these kinds of re recondite doctrines that end up consuming more time and energy than actually getting out into the world and meeting people where you see them as your neighbor, warts and all, and embarking in that work to rebuild, you know, keep your hands dirty and rebuild the lived world every single day. And Christianity gives you those basic rules so you can have an anchor for your heart no 
no matter how much fortunes rise and fall and how much people move around, how much churn there is in American society, but at the same time it gives you this tremendous reach where you can range through the full field of human endeavor, science, art, mathematics, on and on and on and on. And for that reason, Tocqueville had faith that Americans, uh, you know, mid-1800s, and that's been 150 plus years ago, I'm not a mathematician. Um, but we're still doing pretty well in that respect. And you can just see from the way that the pandemic created so much resistance and so much, uh, you know, civil disobedience, really. Um, yeah, a lot of it was, you know, you're, you're doing what? You're injecting what into me? And how long has it been tested? And where is this going? And is it a coincidence that a social credit system is being rolled out at the same time? Part of it was just like, we're a commercial republic and we're going to go insane and we're going to lose our character if we aren't circulating with each other, building new institutions that save our identity and save the habits and the mores that we need in order to keep us who we are. And so, even though that's kind of our unique burden to bear, it gives us certain tools. And some of those tools, I think, have the ability to ameliorate this digital civil war. If you are actually trying to create symbols and brands that show people, large numbers of people, at a glance, that there is a way for them to reinvigorate their bodies and their minds and their hearts so that they open up one to the other. This is our mode of exchange. This is how the spirit moves through us. And if you focus people around that, they're not going to be focused on sitting at home, uh, you know, it's like app number one, conspiracies I'm actively involved in. App number two, people I hate. App number three, you know, it's, uh, it's going to pull people out of that self-enclosure and it's also going to drive them away from this huge abstract layer where this, they're just members of sort of two swarms fighting to see who can become the one swarm. I think we can do that, and I haven't lost faith in it, and I haven't lost faith in the American people, and however theologically tempting it is to believe that 500 years of heresy is going to be destroyed by God, and the Father returns, Daddy's home, it's over, wake up, right? <laughs> as tempting as it is to believe all that, I'm an American, and I have a duty, a duty to my God, a duty to my family, a duty to my country, and a duty to my people to engage in commercial activity that orients people's souls where they need to be in order for us to build new cultural and market institutions on a digital foundation so that America can survive and thrive in a digital world. So if all that means anything to you, it makes any sense at all, I would encourage you to buy the book, I would encourage you to check out Return, and I would encourage you to ask uh, me probably one question each, and that'll only keep us here for about five more hours. <laughs> So, the banner behind you said that we see public policy differently from here, and I think we have made evidence of that this evening. Um, I'm glad that you, in the last part of your lecture, talked about the importance of Tocqueville in all of this, because at first glance, seeing the book, one would think that a French aristocrat from the 1830s would have much to say to what's going on today in the words of technology. If you're making this an important understanding of how we understand America. So you've talked a bunch about it, but at least as a place to start, tell us a little bit more about why Tocqueville speaks uniquely to this period. Well, I admit that I felt like I couldn't really write two books in a row about Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, but he, he was quite young, you know. He was uh, probably younger than Marilyn Manson was when Manson did the dough show. And uh, instead of doing a few music video, he uh, came to the US uh, with a friend of his um, and came back uh, after touring a, a large portion of what at that time still a very large country, uh, and wrote two volumes of Democracy in America. Uh, the first, which came out in about 1840, if memory serves, and the second of which uh, took him about five years. He basically sat up in the attic of his uh, 
his family's Normandy estate and looked across the English Channel where his Norman ancestors uh, invaded uh, uh, the English and wrote volume two of Democracy in America, which uh, is much less uh, sort of uh, intellectual travel reveals uh, to us um, spiritually, theologically, psychologically, and culturally. Um, and so for Tocqueville, what, he, first of all, what he meant by democracy uh, was not, um, <laughs> certainly not what, uh, what our elites mean when they refer to our democracy or our sacred democracy or our global democracy, whatever that is. Um, what he meant was simply the, um, the equality of conditions, is how he put it. Uh, the ever spreading, ever deepening equality of conditions. Uh, and yeah, you could say, well, but Karl Marx was right. At the same time, he said that it was the inequality of conditions that defined uh, his time. But for Tocqueville, he said, you know, I'm not, I don't aim to see, uh, I don't aim to see better than my contemporaries, I aim to see further. Was interested in was the seemingly irreversible, providential lowering of hierarchies and rank throughout the world. The disenchantment of rank, I guess you could put it. Uh, which is why someone like Friedrich Nietzsche, who loved rank, would come along later and say, it's over, everything's been flattened, people are going to start wondering why they should need to be human anymore, and the only way to, uh, to restore to them a kind of solitary pride is, is through the pathos of distance, is through restoring the rank, uh, such uh, profoundly unequal rank, uh, that it would become possible to start thinking of being a super, super, super rich. Uh, but for Tocqueville, that was not possible that it was clear, you know, not just in, during the time that he was alive, but over the, the sweep of Western history, uh, beginning deep in the Middle Ages, uh, to see the progressive uh, stripping away and collapse of these, uh, of these paths of distance and the collapse of social ranks into one sort of teeming social swarm. And what he was uh, eager to show was that it was still possible to, to order and organize a just government successfully under conditions when the, the social mass just became one block. Uh, and for that reason, he was concerned to show that uh, the intermediary institutions that existed in America that kept it from being one entity at the top in a sea That was, that was Hobbes' arrangement, and that came straight out of the Old Testament. Uh, and Hobbes basically said so. Moses, the awesome one combined hope that ever been that low. Tocqueville said, no, 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 the democratic age, that's not going to work. You need these intermediary institutions. He pointed to the newspaper and said, look, newspapers are important not because the news is in them, but because this is what pulls people out of their self enclosure and gets them moving around. This is how they create these institutions that are in between the awesome one at the top any sort of in this, this sediment down below, and it fills out the world in sort of three dimensions of socioeconomic activity. And, you know, this just goes back to what I said in the talk. Um, it nourishes, it's generative, it gives people an ability to scale uh, life to human size and shape and dimension. Um, and for him, that was really important. And so uh, it mattered then, it mattered before digital came along, but now that digital is here, and we have not just Swarm of digital entities of which people are becoming very envious and jealous. The machines remember better than I do. The machines feel my pain. The machines are invisible. The machines fly around like angels. Uh, like, why can't I be that way? Maybe I can be that way. Maybe I can be that way. You've got kids on social media now identifying uh, not as any gender at all, but as members of a swarm. No more personal ID. Okay. Um, but it's, you know, it's not just crazy, it is, it is understandable why this is happening. And so in an environment like this, where overlaying the mass is now 
a swarm and the mass is being conditioned by the presence of that swarm as well as by people at the top who hope to poke the swarm and learn from it and, and merge with it. Conditioned to join it, uh, we need more than ever Tocqueville's counsel that, it, that those intermediary institutions are real and they matter and they matter to our souls as well as to our public life and that at the end of the day, no one's coming going to ride in and save us and do it for us. We've got to do it ourselves. We have to speak to ourselves and risk that encounter of meeting your neighbor as you find them. And risk uh, yourself. Not saying like, oh, well, if only I could code, then I would intervene in public life. Oh, well, if only I was pure and you know, had the right identity or could intone the right magic words or wave the right flag, then I would be you know, it would be safe for me to participate. No, you have to be ready right now. And you have to be willing to risk and wager on your readiness right now to step into that public arena and engage in that kind of activity. And people are being cowed and they're being discouraged and demoralized. It's very bad. And it took those lessons for us that this morning was here. Let's open it up to some questions. We have about 20 minutes or so. Yes, in the back. Um, awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, I wanted to read you off uh, two quotes, one of them by a German. Um, I know you just expressed perhaps your distaste in uh, the German solution to this problem. Uh, but uh, one is, of course, by uh, John Van Neumann, the famous mathematician. He writes, uh, science will, in the future, turn increasingly from problems of intensity, substance, and energy to those of structure, organization, information, and control. I think that that's a uh, very interesting uh, correlate what you were talking about. And then lastly, um, one by Oswald Spangler, of course, in The Crime of the West, he writes, uh, this touches on what you were talking about with fertility. When the ordinary thought of a highly cultivated people begins to regard having children as a question of pros and cons, a great turning point has come. For nature knows nothing of pro and con. Everywhere, wherever life is actual, reigns an inward organic logic and in a drive that is utterly independent of waking being with its causal linkages, and indeed, not even observed by it. The abundant proliferation of primitive peoples is a natural phenomenon which is not even thought about, still less judged to its utility or the reverse. Because when reasons have to be put forward for the question of life, life itself becomes questionable. So I just wanted to uh, sort of that the uh, linkage there between the increasing in science and, and the structure. Why is science going that way in a certain sense? Is it a point of view logic? Of course, Spengler sees has a very pessimistic outlook on, on rationalism and how it corrupts culture. And I'm wondering, and he thinks that it can't be reversed. So I'm wondering, what makes you think that it you know can be reversed? Because I mean, why why wouldn't we just give up? You know that that's true. But yeah. Uh, yes, there are there are many roads to, to pessimism. Um, was it was it Tesla who said he'll live to see man-made horrors be under your government? That's yeah. uh, that is the real Tesla. That's the one you can drive, and then there's the one that you sort of stare at. Um,
when that time will be. Not even I know. That's a big claim. And it's consistent with what has developed as a, a Christian understanding of um, space and time. Uh, one that does not lead to the pessimism of the disenchanted rationalists uh, who, but Bertrand Russell said that if I just contemplate mathematics, that I'll ascend to this pure level of being where I'll just bathe in the cold austerity, the austere beauty of mathematics. And, you know, uh, no, that's not worship, that's just philosophy. No, come on. Man. Yeah. It is worship. Um, but that's not math. And I think that's why you see a lot of mathematicians and scientists who believe the science, trust the science, these people are melting down just like the rest of us for this reason. But what this means is that nature won't save us either. You know, Spangler was a very intelligent man, and in some ways he had very good instincts. But he looked at nature, and the council of nature was, was doom. It was collapse, it was death. And if you're casting about for some uh, comprehensible but also livable way to triumph over death, I can think of one option, and that is the Christian faith. Um, I realize that this is not, in some senses, very inclusive. Um, on the other hand, it could include everyone. So who's to judge what it really means? Um, but on the other hand, it's like, I don't care. I mean, like, I'm a person, and it's totally, you know, the short space of 60 years can never satisfy the longings of man's heart. Like, he's right. Yeah. You're a kid, you're an awkward teenager, you're like, ugh, you're in the 20s, you're figuring it out, you kind of figure it out, hopefully. You got, I don't know, three, four decades before you, you're, you know, yes, this council of nature is death. You are, like, past prime, going down. That is not a long time. Not a lot of time to satisfy the soul. It isn't even a lot of time to orient the soul to God in a way that makes it possible to push through that despair, you know, to, to go into the abyss and then to find the abyss below the abyss, which is the foundation. But it can be done, and millions of people do it every day. And they aren't experts, and they aren't uh, cyborg theocrats, and they don't have advanced degrees, and they aren't childless, and they're not high earners, and they're just gutting it out. Every friggin' day. And if they can do it, so can we. Oh. I was going to ask a, a very pragmatic question, and then you got a very challenging philosophical question. And now I want to ask a very challenging philosophical question. <laughs> um, there's, it came into my mind, there's a, a infamous contemporary philosopher from a temporarily unpopular country um, that. <laughs> <laughs> that made a, Man, he made a, to do already. Yeah. <laughs> um, he has a very, very strong claim. So I want to throw out his very, very strong claim, and then I want your reaction to the very, very strong claim. So the very, very strong claim is he says that the furthest, the furthest extreme fringe of one particular perspective on the whole constellation of concepts you've described. He sees Western liberalism, it's telos going on a collision course from, especially in the post-war period, from cybernetics all the way to transhumanism to what he calls the, quote, kingdom of the Antichrist. Very, very strong claim. The telos of liberalism is the kingdom of the Antichrist. So I wanted to throw that extraordinarily strong claim to you. And what do you make of a claim like that? It kind of sounds like you're a baby. Kind of. <laughs> kind, of kind of. Um, Dugan is offering a geopolitics of the end times. Um, to me, once again, literally, to me, like, so this is how we talk about something else, so I'm going to roll. <laughs> to me, Dugan is a little uh, prideful and is maybe like usurping like the role of God the Father in our eschatological framework. Um, that is my And 
I took a lot of these questions seriously. And at this point in my life, where do I find myself? To be sure, in a university, talking to university students, but not a, not a tenured professor, not a professor, not even someone who just sort of lurks around campuses trying to lure people into his like, conversation. Um, I'm in business. Uh, I make brands. You know, the book, yeah, I read the book, I read the content in the book, there's content in the book, the content matters, but even more important than the content in the book is what the book models. And what it models is that Americans can use Bitcoin right now without any advanced or special qualifications. They can use it right now, get their hands dirty in the technology. Some of the most very powerful digital technologies that we have right now, a world computer, a powerful weapon. And if we don't put our hands on that weapon and become intimate, intimately familiar with how to use it and how to turn it to our needed advantage as members of a commercial republic who must open our hearts one upon the other in order to get the generative juices of society flowing, if we don't do that, they're going to do it. And they're going to turn it into a ratchet for this cyborg theocracy that we That is what the book is modeling. That is why it's for sale in Bitcoin. But James, it's, it's so difficult. I get DMs, this is impossible. Why are you doing this? Ah, and I'm like, okay, great, tech support. I'm here to help. What can I do? Well, uh, no, 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 no. It's like three messages later, it turns out, well, I already have a wallet, but it's not the wallet that Kanan accepts, so like, I don't want to have to get a new one. And I'm like, we went from impossible to, but I just don't feel like it. <laughs> In the course of about one minute, bro, how dare you? Impossible. <laughs> this is why we lose. And people have been conditioned to think this way. It's inconvenient. I can't. I'm out. The eyes glaze over. Uh, it's, it's not for me. Maybe it's not for you. But if we all think that way, it's over. And that's what I'm trying to model with this book. Because I uh, believe that we, at least some of us, need to start creating brands and hold up symbols to huge numbers of Americans who recognize, see a representation, a character, something stamped with some, a symbol that is recognizably American through which they can organize in order to reinvigorate these institutions on a digital footing. That's why I did the book this way, that's why I'm doing the term, um, and that's why I started with the sales pitch. MTV liberal, I honestly, I don't care about liberals anymore. I don't care what it really means. I don't care what the, the history of liberal political like, I don't care. It doesn't matter. What matters is that this is America, and we are Americans, and we are not just a country, we're not just a dream, we're not just a collection of whoever happens to be standing around the territory. We are a civilization that cannot be vivisected and ripped out and deconstructed into these different parts that can then be picked off one by one by postmodern critics so that we can be transformed into body parts of war. We are a civilization that is intertangled, blood, soil, time, history, space, people, ethnicities, denomination, it's a whole thing, and there's no one tying it. There's no separating it out for the purposes of pinning it on the operating table and reducing it to something that can be quantified. So I don't care about liberals. Liberals look bad, liberals look the Antichrist, maybe, not my problem. My problem is how to keep America going in the digital more questions. Yes, Jeff. You had mentioned uh, that the internet was created in response to like nuclear not being enough. I'm kind of, I can't remember how you put it, but it was like the, the next weapon. weapon that wasn't, yeah. yeah, the next weapon. Was it like, what is the, is, is there proof behind that, that that's what it was created for, to be a weapon? Or is it, they, they took it and weaponized it? Well, well lucky for me, there is some proof. Um, the, um, the ARPANET that preceded the internet was the creation of uh, DARPA, the Defense Agency Re Research. The <laughs> Turn off the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> the skunk works for the military industrial complex. I'll look it up on Google. <laughs> And they created our um, by linking up uh, some of the research universities where they had the, their best kind of connections.
connections and relationships a lot of them in California. Uh, so that they can correspond um, in using, you know, basically TCP IP sort of packet, you know, uh, early internet communications technology. Uh, and the reason for doing this was so that uh, in case of an oopsie or maybe a not so oopsie and global thermonuclear war happens, um, there's continuity of government, uh, people can still communicate with each other, and you know, maybe we can even maybe remain a commercial republic in some sort of primitive device sense. Uh, so it was a weapon, it was a defense weapon. Uh, and as time went on, uh, it became clearer that the uh, military applications of digital technology went far beyond, um, you know, prepping. So, and this is, I mean, there's, a, there's a great book by Thomas Ridd called Rise of the Machines, uh, where all this stuff is covered. I also approve for this. Um, you look at the stuff, you know, the sci-fi that was in Star Wars, I mean, this stuff was, was actually built in real life by the military, including the Darth Vader one, before it ever made it into Star Wars. And this stuff is repackaged as entertainment. It's like, wow, George Lucas is genius. He's so creative. Like, Love getting immersed in this fantasy land. It's like, if you only knew, bro. <laughs> it's not a fantasy land. It's pretending to be a fantasy land. Mm -hmm. And so we got a heads up display, we got a Darth Vader helmet, we got uh, the internet, we got, um, I mean, I told you, uh, uh, cable, television, and touch screen, and GPS, all the stuff that goes into all these things that we use to like watch maybe not that great of content. It all flowed out of the military. How's it been used? I mean, you look at the, the TV era. Yeah, they figured out pretty quick. Like, this is a gigantic fire hose of propaganda. And either it's our propaganda that we're spraying people, or, you know, it's the, the commons was, was the main other source. Um, and to the extent that social media is really just, you know, television on, uh, on Vicodin, um, it's the same thing there. Uh, but at a certain point, you have this, I mean, if you want to talk about apocalypsis, we can talk about Rene Girard maybe another day, um, but he has this uh, something that is, you know, maybe kissing cousins to, to Dugan, where he says, look, like, all of this mimetic imitative conflict ends up converging on one sort of ultimate duel, and that, you know, Girard is different because rather than saying, like, yes, we will have this duel, and we will win the duel, and then Paris and Earth, we made it. No, instead he says, like, the cross that we have to bear is battling until the end, refusing to allow this crescendo to reach the ultimate point, the singularity of violence, yeah. um, and suffering, and like, oh, but the tension builds and builds. Yes, it does. The more we progress, the more we advance, the more stuff we fill up the world with, the heavier it all gets, the thicker the air gets, and the more you just want to cut the tension with the knife. If only I could just reach in my phone and strangle my interlocutor. Right? <laughs> no, that is not Christian. You must bear the cross. I mean, bear the cross. Bear the tension. That's true. Uh, and so, as technology sort of converges desires and it converges rivalry uh, toward that single point, uh, propaganda starts to not work. You know, wow, uh, the entire country's media apparatus. Told Americans every minute of every day for a year that Donald Trump was the devil and that he needed to be destroyed. And it didn't work. Uh oh. So, what do you do when you reach the singularity of propaganda where you turn the taps all the way on, rip the taps off, it's just gushing out and it's not having an effect? Well, that's what happens when you create a technology that actually makes machine memory way more powerful than human imagination. And so then the game changes, and then it becomes like, well, we'll have to figure out how to master the swarm. We'll have to create a map that's bigger than the territory. We'll have to do a Google, you know, don't be evil, that's done. It's now organized the world's information. Well, that sounds like pretty, pretty anti-price level little stuff. Organize the world's information on what basis? You know, well, on the basis that we're gonna achieve uh, a kind of transhuman deliverance from the human condition by uh, becoming sort of priests of the swarm. And you put the swarm, and you get data from the swarm, and put everyone in the swarm, and then you can kind of control the swarm. Um, and that's the switchover that we made from the, from the era of propaganda, and that is how digital technology is being used as a weapon in a way that previous television media was not. One more question, and Jack, if I can get a, we, we want to do a wrap.
Yes, go ahead. There's certainly something that uh, we can see very often in conservative messaging, but one might argue that it is innate, almost the psychological profile of maybe the average conservative, which is this de facto pacifism, where we're so focused on restraining power that even when it becomes impossible to constrain it, um, we still are not willing to use it, whether it's the state, whether it's technology. Uh, there seems to be this conservative proclivity to try and, and you know, stand, stand in front of history and yell at it to stop, uh, even when you have no chance, uh, even when that will be weaponized against you on the alternative side. Um, so you're discussing in the digital age, using the technology that is present, you're talking about the book as a model uh, of a blueprint for how we can use technology, how we can use these tools that are available uh, for the advancement of our own, of our own side. Um, my question is, is there a way to overcome or maybe reorient that maybe baseline uh, psychological persuasion uh, that kind of leads to this de facto pacifism? Um, uh, there certainly seems to be you know, lots of uh, intent to get around it, I guess, for maybe the more Silicon Valley reactionary types. Um, but is there a way to do that in mass, do you believe? And what are your thoughts on, on that, that problem as it stands as a whole? I think that the uh, pacifism that you are referring to is really a passivity. And I think that the passivity comes from a loss of faith uh, and a, a belief that, in fact, you can't stand before history or whatever history is supposed to stand in for, for example, and yell stop. Uh, the best you can do is to stay in the fort and go, would you please slow down just a little? Or, you know, like, not everything has to be gay. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, like, I really believe that, that they have been a man. Um, I, <laughs> you know, you can just hear in the, the echoes of the millennials. The history of the universe. The millennials. I did everything right. I got A's on everything. I went to the school. He told me to go to what I did what I was supposed to do. And I had such a rise and I can't get off. I can't find a man. I hate my father and I have a worse job than my dad. And, ah! right. I did everything right. Why am I being punished? I did everything I was supposed to do. I did everything I was told to do. Well, you wind the clock back to the boomers, and it's like, well, we did, we did everything and more. We went to D-Day. We died in large numbers. That was the silent generation. But the boomers, you know, they're like, well, but that was our America. <laughs> we benefited from it. We were given everything. Apex America. Yeah, you might all die in a nuclear blast, but come on, the cars are beautiful, the music is Poppin, like James Dean, like it's good. You know, all of their models were the silence. Mick Jagger was not a boomer. He's not a boomer. <laughs> He's a silent. All the beatniks, silence. And the boomers grew up in that world. And they grew up feeling like they were hidden with everything. And they watched it all fall apart. And they watched themselves sort of like, uh, Segregation is bad, right? I mean, it has to be bad, right? Like, America's good, so how can bad things be happening in a good place? And I have to make these decisions. And, you know, and you had Vietnam, and you had the oil embargo, and you had, like, the Cold War, and, like, all of this insanity. And they felt like, you know, after all of that sort of insanity, then, oh, now it's the 80s, and now we're in our mid-30s, and we're yuppies, and, you know, maybe we can have it all. And maybe we deserve it, finally, because we're good people. So we shouldn't have to suffer, because we're good. And this is what a lot of millennials are saying. And you know what, like, it just ain't true. And if you really believe that the purpose of human life is to be happy, then you are going to be tricked into making yourself powerless. And what you have to understand is that power can only be exercised in a healthy and generative and protective way. 
if it is sourced from sound authority. And there are a lot of people who just don't want to risk and to, and to carry the cross and the burden of being in sound authority. There are a lot of dads out there who are like, well, you know, I don't want to be the bad guy. I want to be the guy who's always saying no. I know my kids, I see how they're brooding, like, well, but they, you know, they make some good, they have some good points, you know. And what happens? Only the best for my pumpkin, I'm sending her to Harvard. And then she comes home and she's like, turn into a literal pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and they don't know what to say, and they don't know what to do, and it's over, and it's over, and it's over then. They just didn't know it. And this creeping passivity where people are like, well, I know things aren't really going the right way, but I am some person, and what am I supposed to do? And maybe this is destiny, and you know, everything happens for a reason, and the universe, like, you know, all just this kind of impacted madness of like the worst of sort of new age, like, Hey kids, here's the spiritual way of like tricking yourself into thinking that maybe it's a good idea to lie to yourself and believe it. Like this is happening. And it is taking away people's abilities to access the divine authority that they need in order to wield even a tiny little bit of power in every way. So I answer your question. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you. I'm reminded of, of course I can look this up. I'm reminded of that phrase from Temple in, in Book Two, where he's essentially prophesying that there will come a time when people will seek government to take away from them entirely the trouble of thinking and the pain of living. Yeah, it's supposed to hurt. I mean, this is why, like, working out, it matters more now. It's always fine, you know. Just like if some, if a man walked down the street. 16th century Florence, and was like, I am now a woman, and you must acknowledge it. You know, it's like, I, kind of whatever, you know, not low stakes, right? Now, it's like, oh, you know, very high stakes. So that, you know, like, the rainbow flag is like, this huge, like, vector flies in, it's like, something else now, like, we are at the top of the top, because of the, 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 the technological environment. And so working out, like, we need sound bodies right now so that we are inoculated against looking at ourselves and going like weird, ugly bags of water. We want to just like be me into the morgue right now, take the pain away. <laughs> the pain of working out, which is guaranteed, if you are getting this exercise, if you are training, you are painting. The pain means it's working. This is true with life. Of course, there's some pain that you can seek out just to punish yourself because you are too cowardly or confused or pathetic or sad to do the real pain, the pain of living. The pain that you know that you really have to like that sinks down in the soul and that only the soul can like turn into something generative. But you gotta do it. Please join me in thanking Dr.
as the Tocqueville School of Public Policy. <laughs> um, that uh, these questions are timeless as they are timely. And so, uh, James, thank you so much for the work you're doing and the challenges that you're bringing. And um, thank you all for joining us. Please stay in touch as we have more events coming up. Uh, we do have a reception with food downstairs just outside the entrance to the library, and we have also books for sale as well. If you're not on our mailing list, please sign up with CJ there at the table, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much.